Hello and welcome to Something to Think About with the British Bible School. And I wonder, have you got a minute? Or can you spare me a minute? Why do we ask people if they've got a minute when whatever it is we're going to do just really won't take one minute? I have a good friend, you, you might have uh, heard him on here sometimes, goes by the name of Patrick. When he calls me, he'll always begin with, I won't keep you long. Well, I don't know what his definition of long is, but we tend to talk about all sorts of things that don't take a short amount of time. And I don't mind, of course, it's a friend, we're talking. And when I ring him and say, have you got a minute? You can be sure that it won't just be a minute. But why do we do that? It never is just a minute. Well, we, we don't want to intrude on people's time, do we? We understand these days that everyone's time is valuable. Everybody's really busy. Society is geared up for saving time. And the problem is, we start to become obsessed with not wanting to take people's time. It creeps into our everyday lives. We want time-saving devices, so we have more time for... What, exactly? You know, reading a verse for today only takes a minute, if that. And is that enough? Should we just take a minute in God's Word? I do it. And I like it when people send me a verse for today. I can't tell you the amount of times something has dropped into my inbox and it's just a verse that someone has sent that they've received that day and thought they'd share it. And it just seemed to speak the right thing at the right time for me then. So it's a wonderful thing. But is it enough? Are we feeling that that is okay? If we only sing the first and last verse of a hymn so we can get home for dinner, what are we really doing? Are we really being in the moment or are we always looking for something else that we need to be doing, time to be saved? Where did it all go wrong? You know, I grew up in an age when all food had to be cooked in a cooker or on the hob in pots and pans. And these are things that you had to take time with. I didn't like to go away from the, the pots because, you know, as soon as you turn your back, the water would boil over. Or in the oven, everything looks fine, but then within a split second, it suddenly burned. And you needed to make sure that everything was cooked properly. But you had to be there and you had to be doing something with it. Then, of course, came along the microwave oven. I remember our first one. And at first, we used to watch it to see what happened. But after a while, you recognise that instead of having to stand there for 30 or 40 minutes as you used to do over the cooker, you could now set this thing for three to four minutes. And because it was all taken care of and wasn't going to go wrong, you could get something else accomplished in that three to four minutes. And what about the other half an hour that you now don't need to stand watching the cooker? What do we do with that? All of these time-saving devices that are helping in our lives, aren't they? Watching the TV used to be something that took a little effort when I was younger. We had three channels to choose from. And if you wanted to change from one channel to the next, you had to get up out of your seat, go across to the television box, and it was a big box, and turn a clunky great handle at the front to change the channel. If it was too loud or too quiet, again, you would have to get up from your seat, go and turn a knob that would adjust the volume. We had quite a progressive black and white television ourselves. You could even adjust the brightness, but you would have to get up out of your seat and go and turn the knob to do it. Time and effort to watch a program. And you had to watch it when it was on. You couldn't record it to watch later. All that time that is now saved by smart TVs. What about going on a journey? Well, you would have to take out a road atlas, find the place name at the back of the road atlas, go to the page, look at the grid and find the town. Then you find the page where your town is on, 
and systematically work through the road systems and go over the pages uh, to find how to get from A to B. Then when you're on the road, if somehow you went off track, you'd have to pull over, get the map out, find out where you are now, and then how to get back onto the road you need to be on. No need for all that now, of course, is there? However, when I pull out of the drive and the sat nav still spinning round, I'll go the way I think it's going to send me, only to find out a minute later, the voice telling me in a mile, you need to do a U-turn. First of all, why have I got to wait for a mile to do it? And secondly, why couldn't it just instantly be ready so I never made the mistake in the first place? You know, with microwaves, smart TVs, Wi-Fi, smartphones, the internet, got many positive things, but not all of them are good. I think amongst some of the, the negatives, there is this desire for instant gratification, for something now. And this then leads to the general absence of patience. Even as I do this, I could make a click on the mouse to instantly get to a page that I need on the computer. Do you remember when we had a thing called dial-up, where you had to dial through the internet to get to what you wanted? So much time is saved. And what are we doing with that time? If life is supposed to be so much better with all the advances in technology, time for the real things in life, then why is there so much anxiety in our society? Why is there so much depression being experienced by people? Why is there a dependency on, on drugs and alcohol? Why do so many people comfort themselves with food? Why are there so many extra strong caffeinated cans of drink available in the supermarkets now? What's happened? Surely we should be more relaxed with all this time that we've saved. We don't have to allow speed and productivity to enslave us. God, I'm sure, created us for deeper, more meaningful things than that. Our fast-paced society has led to a, a superficial existence because we just don't take the time anymore. We even only like to take a minute of each other's time. It's a spiritual problem, really, and therefore it needs to be met with spiritual answers. In the Bible, as we read through it, we find over and over again that character is far more important than reputation. Anyone can put up and gain a good reputation. But what is the character behind it? Is a reputation something that's just for show? But character, you see, is made out of who we really are. Integrity, we find, as we read scripture, supersedes information. You can know such a lot about the Bible, but are you an honest person? Does your life reflect the knowledge that you've learned? Who you are inside matters much more than who others think or say you are. God himself looks at the heart and not at our stature. So how do we slow down and become less superficial? First of all, I would suggest we need to know why we believe what we believe. I grew up uh, with, with parents that already were following Jesus and so as a result being born on one Sunday and taking him a caricot to the church service the next Sunday I'd heard many things and kind of learnt it by rote. You know you, you practice and memorise the times table that's how it used to be done when I was at school but then you had to learn how you got from what a sum to the answer. How did it work? What are the mechanics of it? So I could tell you the answer, but how do we get there? You see, Isaac, when we had to homeschool during the pandemic, he works things out or he's taught a different way of doing things where maths is concerned. And I knew the answer, but if Isaac got a different answer, I couldn't pinpoint where he'd gone wrong because the process was different. Do I understand the process of my faith, the process of why I believe what I believe, 
or are, are I just repeating things like a parrot without really knowing and fully understanding what they are? Do I believe a quotation or something that someone said, or do I believe in the one who it's about? We mustn't take the shortcut and merely accept what others are saying. How have you come to the conclusions that you've come to about the Christian faith? Is it because you heard it in a podcast or saw it on social media? Again, there's some useful things in these areas, but how have these people come to the conclusion that they have about what they say they believe? Are you going to go along with them and say you believe it too because, well, they said it? Or do you understand what they've been through that has led them to their belief? What experiences have you had that scripture has actually helped you with? Yes, we can quote scripture about someone's having a bad day and I will quote to them. This is the day that the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. But why can I rejoice even amidst my upset and suffering and pain? Why is it that I can still rejoice? What is behind it? You see, just reflecting on what that says isn't really helpful. Understanding why that person could say what he did is. So we need to take time in scripture to understand why these things are said. And we need to understand why we believe what we believe. Can people identify that you are a Christian by what you are for rather than by what you're against? Well, I know what Christians aren't supposed to do. I know what Christians are against. But what do you stand for and why? Being against something is easy. It's said in politics that it's so much easier to be in opposition. Because in opposition, all you need to do is listen to what the other group says and oppose it. Take a different point of view. But when you're in power, you've got to come up with the solutions. It's easy to disagree with someone's point of view. But can you come up with a solution and one that works? That takes much more time and much more effort. For some strange reason, we find our identity more as Christians from what we're against than what we're for. And we need to turn that tide. We need to change that attitude. Do we know enough about why a sin is sinful and why God's pattern of life is better? so that we can actually show love and acceptance to sinners who just might not know any better. Why is it wrong to live a particular way? Is it just because the Bible says so? Or is there a reason behind it? There's an interesting little book called None of These Diseases, where the author, I was believed, was, was a doctor, went through the, the rules and regulations that the Jews had in the wilderness about cleanliness and how to live their lives and pointed out that if they did these things, which diseases it would protect them from and therefore why we might be helped in the same way today. So why is something condemned in the Bible? What is it really all about? We need to take time and effort to know why. You see, it's easier to categorise people as particular kinds of sinners, but it takes time and effort to get to know the individual and to find out why they hold the, the world view or social view that they have. What is it that's led them to that thought? Find out why they live the way they do in contradiction to God's plan so that we can understand and therefore help them to see why we are living differently. Rather than categorising our neighbour, we must see them first as God's lost children, because that's what we are without Christ. Superficiality doesn't look inside. You see, there's no time. So we quickly attach labels and, and stereo stereotype people rather than seeing the individual, rather than seeing them the way God sees them, as people who are worth saving as people who it was worth him going to the cross for to reach the lost requires slowing down 
and recognising that love is, first and foremost, patient. Isn't that what Paul wrote first in 1 Corinthians 13? That love is patient. Without purpose and meaning to life, you can't really live. You can still breathe and move about, of course, but you'll be spiritually dead, going through the motions of your everyday life, treading water, as it were. Without meaning and purpose, hope and love give way to fear and cynicism. When you find something that puts fire in your belly, that excites you, that, that you've got a reason to get up in the morning, because you know this thing can make the world a better place. This is something that will connect you with other people, and more importantly, with God. When we find that thing, there's much less opportunity for addiction, or binge watching TV, or filling the emptiness of life with a distraction of social media or video games or sport or whatever it might be. Something awakens in you. Life makes sense. You care more about people and your intentions can be acted upon. Then these labour-saving and time-saving devices can have their place in our life, but not govern and dictate our life and what we do. Having meaning requires sticking with it and persistence. Living for something bigger, larger than ourselves, will inevitably bring disappointment. But it will also bring patience and empathy. Because we see the people and we're taking time to get to know them, rather than just giving a label. When was the last time you were still? Removing yourself from everything to be with just yourself and God. In all the busyness of your life, can you create space to consider the things of God like love and grace and peace? Being still doesn't feel productive, does it? But it can be transformational. Stillness allows God to come into your life. And for most of us, myself included, because I don't really like to sit still. Even if I watch the TV in an evening, I want to be doing something as well. Life, for most of us, is just like a glorified soap opera, going from one disaster to the next. I don't really watch them, but they're so part of our culture, I kind of know about them. And it seems that the same shows have the same actors playing the same characters for decades. And it's just a treadmill of disappointment and hurt that they live through. There's a lot of drama, a lot of catfighting. People marry and divorce. A girl sleeps with her best friend's boyfriend. Then they marry and then he mysteriously dies. There's all this action and activity, but nothing actually really happens. No answers are given. We just look at it and think, well, thank goodness my life isn't that bad. Suffering, for reasons I can't explain, does come to us though. It comes to us like a cold bucket waking us up from our sleepy life. We're like a hamster spinning round on a wheel, going, 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 but getting nowhere. But suddenly suffering comes into our life and it kind of changes our priorities. Suffering, it said, makes theologians out of anyone. And you know what I mean if you've been through it yourself. If you've ever experienced it, you know that suddenly you start to have a conversation with God or wonder if God is really there when there's suffering around. Having taken very little notice of God, suddenly we want a conversation with him. Suffering for many seems to be inevitable, but it needs to be looked on as a spiritual discipline. A culture based on being in a hurry would much rather avoid suffering than learn from it. That's why we have the anaesthetic of overeating, over drinking, overindulging, whatever it might be. Rather than learning from our suffering, we want to avoid it. We would much rather deny that it's happening, numb ourselves to it, or self-medicate from the pain. But is it possible that we might be able to grow from it? Suffering means you learn from pain 
rather than run from it. But we haven't got time for that. We want an instant cure, don't we? If we get into the practice of accepting suffering, maybe we can use that pain and discomfort to help us. After all, isn't pain a warning sign that we need to do something about what's causing us pain? You know, I've had this, this bad chest, we're told if you coughed and coughed and coughed and it's not going away, it's a sign you need to do something about it. Physically, that's true. Could it also be true spiritually? We, we get emotional about our suffering, so it gets our attention. And when these hard times come, let's not run away from it. We must cry if we're in pain. We must mourn and grieve if that's what we're going through. But most of all, we must learn to trust. We mustn't lose hope. We've got to learn from our pain that there's something going on spiritually. If you have faith that something is better is waiting on the other side of suffering, surely that's going to help us to endure. Nobody wants it. No one invites it into our life but suddenly it can change your life. And those things that we were busy with suddenly aren't as important. So suffering can help us to see the truth about life and what it's all about. Ever heard the saying, the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. It's a catchy one-liner that's often said with conviction by many. But like a lot of other Christian jargon, it's more words than substance. So when pain comes into our life, yes, there are quotations we can make, but do we understand why those biblical quotations can actually be of help? See, often in reality, the Bible said what I wanted it to say, and that's why we agree with it. We don't like those hard things, those difficult things that speak against our thoughts and attitudes. Learning spiritual things is more than knowledge or intellect. Britain, I think, is probably more educated today than at any point in history. Yet people are still leaving school, unable to do some of the, the basic things. Why is that happening? Why have they got missed? You see, much of our learning takes place inside of our bubble. And the knowledge we acquire only reinforces our way of thinking. And if someone thinks that they can't learn something, all the educational establishments in the world aren't really going to help. That individual needs to be helped. But so many are missed with this scattergun approach to learning. And that could be the same in the church as well. People get missed and they don't actually uh, become able to learn the things that they, they need to to help them. Speaking of these bubbles of education, our young people go to university and come out with all sorts of daft ideas about our origins and nowadays even gender and who knows what else because there's no one there to ask the right questions and everybody agrees. You know what it's like? You, you attract people, birds of a feather flock together. We attract people who believe the same things. But where's the questioning? You see, the same thing that happens to our young people in university, that come out with these high sounding ideas, which are really sometimes ridiculous, more often than not are helpful, I hope. But in the church, we could have the same thing happen. We all agree with each other. There's no one to challenge are thinking about what the Bible says. So we can know why we believe, what we say we believe, because it's been challenged and we know the argument for it. Learning about biblical, spiritual matters is about constantly engaging with new ideas and perspectives that come along and challenging it against God's word. God's word doesn't need to change because it's true. If something is true, if it's a fact, that's the way it is. All other learning, it seems, has to be adjusted according to modern ideas and new discoveries that are made, but not the Bible. But the Bible can answer these things, but do we know how to do that? 
the message of the Bible never changes, but are we equipped to deal with the ideas that come out of universities or podcasts or social media? If we merely spout out the words others have said or have given us, we can sound judgmental. But there is a humility that comes with learning for ourselves because we've been on a journey and we've been challenged ourselves. It helps us to be empathetic because we've gone through a learning experience and have had our ideas challenged. We've figured it out and now we know why we have concluded in the way that we have. But it takes time. It's not a quick fix. Learning with humility will help us not be afraid of new ideas and new perspectives that are new to us or seem to be different. You know, there's nothing really new under the sun. But it helps us to love people by getting to know them rather than turning away from them due to a belief they hold which is different to ours. So a, a label is put on them and we cast them aside. And that's just wrong. We need to take the time to learn and understand and help them. Knowing someone is a desperately needed antidote to a society that is increasingly plagued with individualism. Intimacy with other people is about drawing near to one another and getting close. And this requires vulnerability because you're going to find out about my weaknesses if we're very close. We need to allow God to use us to let others see him through us by letting them see who we really are. Not who others think we are or the bits we want other people to see, those characteristics that we're OK with. But what about those difficulties in my character and life? Getting close to someone is risky. It can lead to pain. It can be difficult. I mean, that's been my challenge, actually. Getting close to someone with a risk that I might lose them someday. You've probably been there yourself. I don't want to get close to someone again because it hurts too much to lose them. Why develop a close friendship if it's going to open you up to those kind of things? Well, if we do not take the time to open our lives up to others, we may never experience that wonderful connection and communion and fellowship that we're meant to enjoy as human beings. The only option other than that is to remain in the status quo and be superficial. People who avoid intimacy usually end up afraid, closed-minded and quite frankly difficult to be around. You see, we can live in a culture where speed reigns, where being in a hurry is king. But what we've got to do is be intentional about ensuring that our spirituality isn't superficial and that takes time. Don't just read the Bible, reflect on what it means to you. Instead of a verse for today, read around the context, find out why that verse is there, what happened before it, what happened after it. Instead of a mere quotation, offer an explanation. This is why this verse means something to me, because I was going through this and I saw that and it made me realise what? Instead of a quick nod as you pass each other by, let's take time to get to know each other, to stop and listen and seek to understand. Yes, let's, let's value each other's time. But when someone asks, have you got a minute? Let's tell them we've got two, just for them. The Word became flesh so we could connect with God. The Word became flesh so he could dwell amongst us and we can get to know God through him. That took time. He had to spend time away from his father. Are we, God's people, connecting with each other in that same way and connecting with others who don't yet know God? Can people really get to know God through us? Because we don't have a superficial faith. We're not interested in saving time so we can go on to the next person we're interested in you, that person in front of us right now, so that they might know God through us. It will take time, but let's not live a superficial life. 
Let's take time to be holy. Let's take time for God. Let's take time for each other.